look anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Lori H. Schwartz, World of Schwartz, coming to you from, once again, still hot, very, very hot, sunny, Los Angeles, Hollywood, California. And this week on the Tech Cat Show, we're going to jump into some big trends, technology impacting your business, specifically in the video content space, with, with one of the people I think is actually the foremost expert in video content in our world, and that is the fabulous Sahil Patel. And Sahil is, right now, he is actually one of the editorial, or the editorial director of Video Inc., which is a hot trade publication that exclusively covers the digital video industry. It focuses on everything from content and advertising to technology and trends. And Sahil is actually always one step ahead of everyone on that content beat. He's um, he's got this great spot, you know, eye on trends. Um, he's able to really spot sort of controversial movements from players in the space, which I always think is really cool. I'm staring at John, our engineer today, because Sahil is actually coming in from Skype today. Are you there, Sahil? Yeah, I'm right here. Woohoo! So this is the first time since I've done the show that I don't have a human being here. So John is my psychological <laughs> human person. You um, should just take a take a pic, a photo of myself, I'll put it on John's face, and I think it will work out. <laughs> well, I'm turning my monitor towards her so she can actually see a little bit what's better. going on. <laughs> There we go. Because with all the audience that's in our radio booth as well, yeah. it got, gets very crowded. Oh, I know. Right? So it's it's <laughs> nice to uh, have a little more space by not having our, our guest actually here. So you are one of the smartest, uh, funniest, sassiest uh, writers I know in the business, in the content space, uh, Sahil. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to now, what your role at Video Inc. is. And I met you first at Synopsys, where you were covering all the digital there, and I was so impressed by how much you know um, for someone so young. So <laughs> you, you can just keep the, uh, the compliments coming. I, right. I, I have no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your role at Video Inc. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, uh, editorial director of Video Inc. Uh, it is yep. still there. Did mm -hmm. Sahil go bye-bye? No, he's still there, but I guess he's. Uh, it's a little bit of a hiccup that we're having at the moment. Oh, Online video, on digital video, yeah. however oh, you want to call it. Hello? Oh, yeah, we lost you for a second. Can you say that again, Dahl? Sure. Uh, do you want me to start from the beginning? Yeah, you might as well, because the beginning's the beginning. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you hear us? You have an intermittent connection, it looks like. We're having some connection issues. Yeah. All right, well, um, there he is. Oh, no. Did you guys lose me again? Yeah, we're losing you. Keep talking. Hmm. Um, okay, sure. I'll start from the beginning one more time. <laughs> sure. Okay. Third uh, time's a charm. Yeah. Okay. So, as you said, yeah, I'm uh, the editorial director of Video Inc. Uh, we exclusively cover the online video space. Uh, the site's now 18 months old, and we launched it with with the goal of only and exclusively covering digital video. Whether we're talking about uh, original series, branded entertainment. Video tech, ad tech, mobile video, social video, YouTube creators, MCNs, uh, sort of anything that feeds into the growing industry that is uh, digital video in, in a fashion that is somewhat similar to what, you, uh, what the traditional side has experienced with the deadlines and the, uh, and the Hollywood Reporter and Variety, but again, uh, only covering things that are made for digital platforms first. You know, and I remember when you told me about going over to Video Inc. and I thought to myself, God, that's going to be so limited to just talk about video content online but the truth is it's huge and there's yeah. so much going on and there's and you're sometimes uh, um, you, you blast out news throughout the day because it happens to be a crazy day with acquisitions and things like that so how are you managing all this is there a system to how you report things I wouldn't say there's uh, any particular system it's more uh, because it's still such a young industry and anything can happen at any moment. Uh, you really never know what's coming down the pipeline sometimes. It's really just staying on your feet nonstop because at one moment it might be an acquisition story and then a few hours later it might be a, you know, just a major program launching or another major brand deal signed or something. Uh, there's, always, there's so many players in this space um, when you look at it in, in, in sort of the broad way that we're trying to look at it. Uh, there's never just one 
specific system as I at least had uh, back at Synopsys. So, and, and when you say all the players in this space, so are you dealing with traditional ad networks, traditional networks? I know you said multi-channel and YouTube, but really those companies now are all being acquired by the, the regular network. So who, who is actually in your ecosystem now that you report on? I would say all of them, right? That's the, that's the issue because it's not just, yeah, you know, I cover the multi-channel networks on YouTube. I cover YouTube itself, but then there's also uh, the ad tech industry, you know, whether we're talking about someone like uh, Freewill or Adapt.TV, we're covering them. We're covering other major video uh, companies online, you know, whether it's AOL, Yahoo, Hulu, Netflix, um, Amazon, as they've been trying to crackle. It's such a, <laughs> yeah. it's such a big space and it can, it can work in so many different ways that, um, all of them, yeah, as best as we can, uh, covering all of them. And and now, you know, at least recently, as as you sort of referenced with the, with the interest from the traditional media side in acquisitions, we're also covering a lot of the traditional TV networks and and media companies that are looking to get into the digital video space in a big way. What have you seen as a big trend in the last six months in terms of a change in this industry? Like you, you just mentioned one that the traditional side is much more interested, but are are you seeing any other really big trends in this space right now? I would say that's the honestly the major one. I think for a few years now, everyone was sort of predicting that at some point uh, there was going to be consolidation. Uh, the industry was going to find a way to get a little bit smaller and a little bit more vertical. And we kind of have been seeing that, if you want to say in the last six months, maybe even in the year, it kind of really took a, took, took a, like another step when uh, Disney decided to acquire Maker Studios. But even before then, uh, you had interest from traditional uh, studios such as DreamWorks acquiring multi-channel networks, and even looking beyond YouTube. You know, you, we've had uh, a lot of acquisitions in the ad tech space. Adapt TV got bought by AOL last year. Comcast bought Freewill earlier this year. Um, it just seems to be a, 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 a significant consolidation within this space. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a good thing or not. Not right now. It's still. Uh, let's wait and see. Uh, yeah. But that's definitely the, been the big thing uh, this year. And what, what, what is your background? Like, how did you come to report on this space in particular? Because it's such a hot space and you're like right time, right place right now. Wh where did you come from that you got so smart and so savvy about this space? Um, honestly, it's kind of funny. Uh, if I am in the right spot, you know, at the right time right now, it was probably the same way when I really started covering the industry, I guess now three and a half years ago. Um, I don't have much of a background in the entertainment space beyond uh, before I was working at, at Synopsis, but um, I had been working at a, uh, a big book publishing uh, uh, powerhouse, uh, Ingram, and I would, had been working for their marketing team when you know the iPad had just f first come out. And so the entire uh, situation there was about tr traditional media trying to sort of adapt to uh, a digital, digital innovation, a digital revolution. So when I came on board at Synopsys, that was the the perspective I brought to it. As the video industry was sort of facing the same um, same challenge that the print industry has been, uh, and that kind of just went from there. So it's this idea of dis you know constant disruption almost right. you know, mm -hmm. um, and spotting a trend before it happens. So before you write about something, you know, are you thinking about it, or is it literally that a piece of news comes in and that's how you decide this is a trend I have to report on it? It works both ways. Uh, you know, of course, we get plenty of, uh, of pitches or plenty of uh, news that comes in and we know we have to report on it. And that, in most cases, um, will sort of just be a standard story with a little bit of a, our take on what we think about uh, that development. But, uh, you know, we're also constantly thinking about uh, what are what are the trends? What are what are people thinking about? What are people talking about? And how can we report about that in an intelligent way? Um, so it's a, it's a good mixture of both. And is it that every PR person sends you the press release or you're using, um, you know, reporter communication tools that gives you, you know, APR and things like that? I mean, I mean um, not APR. That's <laughs> 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 I just met with my banker. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I mean, you get you're connected to all the latest news outlets that publish the generic stuff and then you're taking it and and uh, and sort of sifting through it for trends. Right, right. Uh, most of it uh, when we're just talking about like. I don't want to call it hard news, but just straight news, uh, daily news. Uh, we get from uh, from PR, and we, you know, in, in terms of editorializing, we pick what's actually relevant to cover um, within the context of what people are interested in the industry. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, just you know, scouring uh, the web, a lot of different places to go to to see what um, what's happening right now. Uh, sometimes it's so easy to miss out on things. It's fascinating 
So like whenever I get like a, a moment to look back at like holy crap like there's like five stories that I could have written about but I just didn't have the time to because we were doing we were covering all of these other developments that have been happening in this space. Right. I mean it is really crazy. So last night was the uh, nomination event for the Streamies, <clears throat> which is uh, an award show in the video content space that. Um, you know, it's been going on for a while, but was controversial a couple of years ago because it wasn't so professionally done, but then it's gotten really professional and hot again. And so um, what do you think about the streamies and were there any nominations or winners announced last night that you're surprised by or any trends that you see coming out of the, the streamies event? Um, I would say nothing that was really all too surprising. I think it's still so early on to really um, have the streamies sort of be... Uh, representative of a trend or, or or a particular thing that's happening in the way that maybe some of the traditional award shows or uh, just award programs uh, kind of do. Uh, streamies are pretty populist, right? They're they're looking to be um, the equivalent to an Emmy for the online video industry, and right now they recognize everyone from YouTube creators to original web series uh, brand brands uh, celebrities who have made the jump to or expansion to digital. Um, but right now it seems more of a, uh, a, a, a way to see what's cool or interesting or popular in the space versus um, something that really uh, points to something that's happening within the industry itself. Um, oh, got it. So it's, is it, are you saying it's more of the popular vote right now? Than yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, it's like who, you know, of epic rap battles would win, a, would win a streaming, but of course they would because they get, um, you know, close to what twenty-five to thirty million views per episode. Um, not to not to sort of discredit that or anything along those lines, but uh, it's the streamings are uh, I think by very nature what a lot of online content is a popularity contest. Uh, but they are the only sort of real player in the space when it comes to uh, recognizing excellence. You know, in in creative and online video. So I wouldn't say they point to a specific trend. They just kind of point to what's hot right now what that people like and would you say that that then is something that advertisers and brands should pay attention to because a lot Absolutely, of these yeah. youtube folks are um brands are surrounding them and getting eyeballs but the, the i got into an argument not an argument a friendly debate on facebook <clears throat> with a colleague who was comparing a game of thrones viewership to a very popular hot youtuber who had you know just as many views as say compared to watching an episode of Game of Thrones. And there's a quality issue there and a cultural issue and a budget issue. And so can you ever really talk about broadcast television and compare it to YouTube no. content? You know, are, right. are they in the same worlds even? I wouldn't say most of it isn't. Uh, a large major, a large percentage of it uh, isn't. Um, I actually had a conversation, funny enough, about this earlier today. Uh, but the real thing is, you know, you can say, uh, so and so YouTube show gets 25 million views per episode, and you can say, um, you can say, uh, 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 Game of Thrones has I, I forget their most recent rating num ratings numbers, but let's pretend it's 15 million viewers on average. That's not a one-to-one -one translation. I'm sorry, but you know, if you even, even, if, even if you ignore the fact that mo there's very very few YouTube content outside of the gaming industry that runs for 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, you can't directly translate a view on YouTube to a viewer on television. You can't do it, at least not right now. So to say you get more views, you don't, you, you have no real way of independently verifying that, in my personal opinion. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. there yeah. is there is good content on YouTube that you can sort of like, I think, stack up against uh, television. If you look at, I think the best example is really uh, Freddie Wong's uh, uh, web series, Video Game High School, right? Uh, the second season of the show, they did six episodes each episode was in in the 30 minute range and if you if i if you had knew nothing about american american television i told you this show was on nickelodeon or disney channel you would not be surprised by it, it has the same sensibility really high production quality so there is great content on there that can be comparable but a large majority of it even if it's premium isn't necessarily television but, or nor does it need to be right right and so that that's the question i wanted to ask you because coming from the advertising industry you know, everyone was always talking about um, ratings and making them equivalent to web content viewership and let's come up with the same metrics for both. And I'm always like, why? Why do we have to? Why can't we have these two separate worlds that are monetized differently, that are culturally different, that are behaviorally different? Like, why do you think everyone wants to shove them all into the same thing? 
Well, it's a, it's a cynical way to approach it, right? But it's, at, at the end of the day, what, are, what is the thing that you hear about maybe the most, let's say, during the digital content new fronts, that entire week or two weeks? It's about getting TV dollars to move over to digital. And uh, there's a, a lot of people who believe, and I kind of agree with some, some of it, uh, a lot of people who believe that um, the only way to really make that happen is to make digital sort of measurable in the same kind of way that advertisers have are have just used to are used to on television on traditional media if you can provide the same sort of metrics and same sort of uh approaches to analyzing the success of a particular piece of content or or power of a particular uh, particular star uh it will make it easier because they are because you know then the advertiser is more comfortable with the data it would be it would make it easier for them to shift move uh, dollars to digital it's a cynical way to look at it. I can I can understand that view, but I also I'm also of the of the mind why can't it be separate because they clearly do two different things at least right now. So in a way, it's because the agencies and the brands who have these tools in place, you know, buying and planning tools in place, those are more for broadcast, and mm -hmm. their tools don't accurately reflect this YouTube digital web content space, and so from a reporting justifying spending money, from their culture, from the people that do this day in, day out, it doesn't fit right now into their world. So mm -hmm. part of it is just a technicality that there aren't systems in place for this new monetization model, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, to be fair, there are uh, uh, things happening that sort of are moving that along. Uh, at the same time, there are also brands who don't necessarily, uh, brands and agencies who don't necessarily uh, have that uh, hesitant approach to digital video. They are uh, pretty aggressive and and and, um, and uh, excited about it. So it's not it's not. I don't want to make too much of a generalization about it. But in in a lot of cases, I believe that is the case. I think the systems aren't necessarily in place enough yet uh, to make that transition uh, where it's not just traditional or digital, but it's really truly uh, cross platform uh, possible in an honest way. Well, I think you just you raised a couple of interesting points because after all, you are Sahil Patel the most fascinating man out there but um <laughs> in the digital I should, I should i should just grab like a like a glass of whiskey right now yeah, that's like. right <laughs> the most interesting man in the world john where is it <laughs> oh, occasionally we have some noise um but um my question for you is there's so of the companies that are doing sort of aggressive spends in this space is there some a trend there like who are they and what are they doing that's interesting and working would you say on the brand side? Yeah, on the brand side, you know, pick a pick a brand um, that's doing something really aggressive and interesting in this space. You know, the most interesting one I think right now, because uh, you know everyone always likes to talk about um, uh, the the, two, the twin pillars of I think of brand online video, which is uh, Red Bull and GoPro right now, right? right but right. Um, the the company that I'm looking at, and I mean they're no small company by any any sort of measure. It's Pepsi. They're actually looking to do a lot of interesting things with it. They're investing in it. You know. Their uh, their uh, CMO was at the YouTube Brandcast event, uh, sort of talking about. I mean, I think he opened the entire his presentation with "I love YouTube" or "Thank God for YouTube," um, and they're investing a good amount of money with it. You know, they launched the, that Digital Studios division to create original content. They have this partnership uh, with Maker Studios, which was announced as part of Maker's uh, New Front event, where they're going to be actively working with talent to co-create content. You know, uh, Maker sort of also was part of Pe Pepsi's. Um, expansive multi-platform uh, su uh, Super Bowl campaign. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I forget the exact um, name of the campaign, but uh, Maker Studios like did a, did a prank on their board of directors and it was part of uh, uh, like getting amped for, for the Super Bowl halftime show, which uh, Pepsi was sponsoring. So when it comes to brands um, who are active and interested and, and aggressive in the online video space, I think the one to look at right now is, um, is Pepsi. Well, so that's interesting. So is it because um, they want millennial eyeballs, basically? Um, or is it because, you know, they, they see where the future is going, and in the end, it will all be IP-based video, and so those that understand how to leverage that platform are going to win? Or, or is it really a demographic play? They just want those, those millennials. I think it's the latter. I think Pepsi is one, of, you know, is at the level of brand uh, awareness and recognition where they don't necessarily <laughs> need to be like, oh, we need to be in front of millennials. They're in front of millennials every day. Every time you walk into like a Seven Eleven, they're right there. Um, so I think mainly it's just sort of uh, getting in front of what is just naturally going to happen in the industry, is which is this um, expansion into digital and sort of having digital and IP based 
uh, content delivery, everything be as part of the uh, entertainment uh, value chain as uh, as traditional has been for a long time. You know, it's so interesting because, uh, you know, we just had the Emmys and I'm very involved, as you know, with the interactive media folks at the Emmys and we give out awards um, to folks that are doing really innovative or creative excellence in interactive media, which is not the same thing as YouTube content. But my question to you then is, what ultimately is the difference then between a great piece of broadcast content that, say, is 15 minutes long and a piece of YouTube content? I mean, are they going to be, you know, balanced the same, ultimately, if everything is IP-based? Because it is culturally different, right? You're having yeah. content that has much less of a budget towards it, professionals that aren't necessarily union. Um, you know, it's really different, but they could both create 20 minutes of highly entertaining, great content that has a lot of eyeballs in the digital space once those, you know, delivery systems merge. So will there still be a difference between the two? I, I absolutely, uh, I think so. Uh, I think the the issue, uh, part of the issue, one of the issues, one of the many issues. Is, <laughs> if there weren't it, issues, you would not have the role that you have. So No, absolutely are... not. People, I would just be writing boring stuff. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but, you know, it's it comes down to, like, one of the things it comes down to is pure just expectation from the audience. When you go to YouTube, you are not looking for the same kind of experience that you are looking for when you turn on HBO. Uh, it's right. just a fact. Um, the relationship is different between the content that you're watching and 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 yourself. Uh, the the way you watch that content can be different. Uh, people are active in commenting on YouTube videos. And again, I don't want to make this too much of a YouTube discussion, but I think that's uh, relevant because I think it points to the fact that uh, web-based content right now can be has the ability to succeed and ability to succeed by being very targeted to uh, a particular interest, a particular type of viewer. Uh, whether it's YouTube or anywhere else, whereas, you know, naturally more of the traditional media content, more of the television content has to go a little bit broader. Um, and I think that won't ever really change that much. I think even when you can watch a YouTube video as easily as you can watch a, uh, a HBO on your channel, I think it's going to stay the same. I think it's going to stay the same as it is today, where uh, there is a natural difference in what you expect out of web-based content and uh, than you do out of uh, out of television content. It's a completely different experience, and I think yeah. same. I think the same thing applies at least right now for even AOL, which is doing short form originals as well as uh, licensing uh, traditional media content. Yeah, it's 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 so, this is so interesting because I wonder. I haven't asked my my stepson who's going to be twenty in a couple of months, and I knew him when he was ten. So ask me how I feel about that. But <laughs> <laughs> step and teen are very powerful words together, but. Um, uh, I haven't ever asked him, does he experience, you know, Game of Thrones the same as he does when he watches? I mean, he's a voracious YouTuber. Um, mm -hmm. And so is our 16 year old, uh, my stepdaughter. So they're they're huge YouTubers. And I, I and, but they're also they also watch regular television, too. Yeah. But definitely mm -hmm. more on demand. I mean, I would say that, you know, in fact, this weekend I, I noted my my stepdaughter was like binge watching on Netflix um, some of the ABC family stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I haven't ever asked her if her, cognitively, does she have the same expectations of ABC Family stuff on Netflix as she does with all the stuff she's watching that's YouTube? Because she used to love Shay Carl. So is she expecting mm -hmm. the same thing? Or does she even care? Like, does her brain care? You, th you think uh, Shay Carl versus Pretty Little Liars? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because it's her. She loves both. Yeah, I think I, I, I get what you're saying. I think I mean I wouldn't have the perfect answer for that, but I think more than anything else, it's just a different inherent um, piece of expectation. content. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you, there's a reason you want to, she's going to watch Shay Carl versus a reason for why she wants to watch the latest episode of of Pretty Little Liars, and they both are have equal merit. They both equally can be equally entertaining to this generation right. because this generation is growing up being home and watching television still. It's not, it's not like they're not watching television. It no, could television's be... hot again. Television's yeah. the, new, the, new, the new black or orange is seems, black too or something. <laughs> it seems so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a cliched thing, I think, to say, but at the end of the day, great content is great content. If they're going to want to watch something, they're going to watch it. It's just, I think, the experience that a particular platform uh, provides. And I, 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 that's why I, you know, I like to group the Netflixes and the other SWAT platforms in one thing. Right. You know, one, that one. they are television, even if it's an original series made for a digital platform like Netflix or Amazon, it's still television. And the way you sort of approach that is way different than watching your favorite YouTube channel. I mean, I'm not, I don't watch too many YouTube creators, but I have my favorite YouTube channels. I like to watch 
you know, Above Average, which is a sketch comedy ch uh, channel from uh, uh, Lauren Michaels Broadway, Broadway video, what I get, what I expect out of watching comedy sketches on YouTube is completely different from me wanting to watch, you know, thir um, 30 Rock on Netflix. Right, right. So you just know it's going to be different. Um, yeah. So let me ask you, so Pee Wee just announces that he's, he's not, he's turning off YouTube comments, right? He's over it. He doesn't Goodbye. feel... So I said Pee Wee? You said Pee Wee. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Pee Wee. I call How old are you, Lauren? I call, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not of the generation that watches him, but I, I, stu you know, I study the trends, and I was just reading you know, that he has turned off YouTube comments. He doesn't feel that his community r is really using those comments. You know, he, he stated that those are just um, you know, haters. Um, and that his folks are on Twitter and elsewhere. And so he's looking at integration with other social networks to handle the feedback and the community interaction with his YouTube content. Do you think that's a trend launching? You think more YouTubers are gonna turn off um, the commenting? Because you know, when you talk about interactivity, YouTube isn't really interactive. I mean, they have annotations, they have that cool playlist, but other than that, it hasn't really evolved. And so for real true interaction, we are turning to Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram to sort yeah. of house our television mm -hmm. fandom. So wh what are your thoughts on that whole piece of P duty, P, was, P small was, person gaming dude, it. very <laughs> rich human being in Australia guy. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sweden. Sweden. Uh, is that Completely where he is? On continent, yeah, he's Swedish. I thought uh, I thought he was Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. why he's not returning my calls. All right. So anyway, <laughs> what? So what do you think about that whole thing? I think uh, it wasn't. I'm not gonna say it wasn't. It was unsurprising or anything. Uh, yeah. It was a little surprising to see a major YouTube star say I'm gonna turn off comments because you all so often hear YouTube stars saying how important uh, commenting and you know I interacting with their audience on, on in the comment section is important to them but I think you are right in the sense that um, the YouTube commenting system might not, not you know going forward might not play as important a role as the other social media platforms I mean uh, when you when if you are a, a an online influencer and you've built an audience whether it's on YouTube or vine or where have you you're not just there you're across the board you have a large Twitter following you have a large Facebook uh, fan page you have a large tumblr following if you're on tumblr like it's across the board and you're interacting with people all over the place so it's not necessarily just restricted to the to the gates of youtube so it's if more creators start doing that and i think you uh, i wouldn't be surprised by it it's probably going to be potentially uh, uh the style of creator that's actually talking almost directly to the audience right yep. uh, vloggers yep. beauty gurus of those types uh but you know even like beyond that i think um the general trend is just that uh, more and more stars are going to be having their, uh, you know, their interactions with their with their biggest fans across every platform that they are on, and I, that's why you see platforms such as uh, there's this is one uh, uh, startup called Epoxy that uh, that is growing right now, and that's a platform that exclusively makes it easier for for stars to you know interact with their biggest fans across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and you know multiple social media platforms. So I think. That's going to uh, happen more and yeah. more. Why is yeah. YouTube kind of blowing it here? I mean, why aren't they investing in the technology to, I mean, I, I would think that's a no-brainer. They should have been working on that. Uh, yeah. Okay, working on when you say working on our technology, like working on a way. Well, to yeah. I, I mean, John just brought up a good point. You know, they've been putting a lot of effort into Google Plus, um, which could kind of house some of this. But why has YouTube as a platform not dealt with the commenting themselves? Why haven't they made that better? Why haven't they been more? Well, innovative? they tried to, didn't they? That was the and they, they got well the, the integration, the integration of Plus and everything. But, but remember, every it was also it was an effort to sort of curb spammy posts and allow people. Yeah. Um, but it's you know, still like, not interactive. It's still this like anyone could post anything and, you know, it's haters. I think, haters, I think haters, part haters. of it is like it's no one has a secret sauce yet, right? I yeah. think there's got to be a way. And I mean, th what's not to say that they aren't working on something that sort of improves the commenting method? But wouldn't but, you oh, saw Hill Patel know that because you know everything? Uh, I guess I don't know this one. <laughs> um, no, it's also and I think uh, I, I'm going to take the. Um, the the devil's advocate position yeah, on this please. just because uh, you know it's easy to sort of like strike i think down youtube and i do it funny enough god knows uh but they're one of they're the giant right they're the yes. giant in the industry and any small thing that they do they're going to get a lot of detractors 
uh, they're going to get a lot of people saying this doesn't work. That's a bad idea. Right. Because um, they're just so don't... big. Right. Right. Exactly. And I think at the end of the, at the end of the day, even if they are working on something like that, um, we just don't know what the perfect version of that would be yet. And um, and if they even tried to figure that out and implemented changes, they would face an immense backlash. So it's like it's less like why hasn't YouTube tried to fix this, and more just like. Why should YouTube even attempt to fix this? Let them, they're already doing remarkably well with, with their business Yeah, that's model. right. And, they, and now they're looking at ways to um, allow people to almost um, contribute to their favorite YouTubers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're right. letting you tip and do other things and figuring out they, additional monetization. Right. They're focusing on the issues that actually um, are more important to the creator community. To the, so they're really turning to the creator community. They're creators focusing. are not worried about engaging their fans. They'll find ways to make sure they still uh, they stay interacting with their own fans. They're more worried about making money on YouTube. That's been the big thing, you know, ever since right. we first learned about the cut, the forty five percent, you know, fifty five percent ad split. It's so, so crazy. That's what the creator's going to worry about. Uh, you know, yeah, PewDiePie turned his comments off, but he's not, he's not like just going to stop interacting with his fans. He's like, no, we can talk on Twitter, we can talk on our other platforms, and other creators might do that as well. But at the end of the day. Uh, it's not hard to engage with your fan base online, whether it's on or off YouTube. What's hard is to make money. So I, I'm okay. I think most people will be okay if YouTube focused a little bit more on that than the other stuff. That's a great point, and that leads into the the other topic that you always have to talk about with Utah YouTube, which is advertising and brands and how they're playing on YouTube. And I was always frustrated when I was at the agency a couple of years ago when their sales team would come in and they would say, "You have to spend 200k." And it's all on the platform, and it's going to push to your videos on YouTube, and your brand will get great exposure. And it, it, to me, that was always like, well, my people aren't in YouTube already. I want to get them to YouTube, so I need to spend money outside of YouTube. Why are you forcing me to spend all this money inside the platform? It's just not how people use the web. So do you, do you think they've moved forward in their understanding of, of this and how, how brands should work within YouTube content world? Buying. Are you uh, are you talking specifically about like sort of YouTube moving forward? Yes, yes. I would say so. Yeah, and I think it, part of it has been helped by the fact that more and more brands are interested in sort of working within the YouTube ecosystem, and that certainly made it a little bit easier. Um, when it comes to YouTube and brands, you know, there's a certain way to I think do YouTube, and we're talking about a company that you know is not has you know was historically not been a media company. It's been a tech platform. Right. You know? Well, like yeah, all YouTube. like all of these platforms in many ways, they're they're all yeah. coming out of engineering in Silicon Valley to a certain extent. Yeah, they're, they're not they're not networks and, and studios and, and, and agencies and brands. They're they're tech platforms. Um, so very, there are still there's still hurdles to cross. There's still uh, uh, issues within within both sides of the uh, of the ecosystem where one doesn't really understand how the other one works. Uh, at the end of the day though, I think YouTube has gotten a little bit has gotten better especially in the past year in terms of uh, getting brands on board. If you look at finally opening their doors to uh, Nielsen OCR, right? That was right. something that like they never did, and now they're doing it, which has made it easier for brands to consider uh, you know, media on, on that platform. Uh, this whole Google Preferred thing, which is entirely designed to make buying ads on YouTube very, yeah, very simple. Can you simple. De describe that to our audience so they understand what that is? Sure. So, I mean, the, you know, the big, what's been the biggest issue when it comes to brands wanting to advertise on YouTube, it's the, it's the fact that it's a massive platform that you can't really contain and you never know where these videos, you know, where your ads would go and, you know, where they would uh, or, show up. Or, yeah, where they would show up in, in front of which videos, if they were of high quality or not. And that's always kept them um, just the rates down uh, for obvious and understandable reasons. Uh, with the launch of Google Preferred, what, what uh, Google slash YouTube is basically doing is they're taking the top 5% of channels across uh, all the top verticals. So we're talking about news and politics, music, comedy, you know, all the all the the, the verticals that brands are interested in. They're taking the five percent of top five percent of those channels, and this, this is measured not just by like views, but also engagement, a lot of uh, time, watch time, time other metrics right. sort of. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and by they're basically closing that off. Um, they're just awarding that off for the brand, saying, you know, we guarantee you that uh, your ads would only run on these channels, whether you buy the news vertical or whatever, whatever other vertical, and then they're also allowing that to be measurable uh, by stuff like Nielsen OCR. So it's just making it very similar to, uh, uh, I would say, television in the sense that, okay, I want to buy a, uh, you know, ads against the news category, and I know for a fact that it's only going to be the premium content, against the premium content that shows up, uh, shows up on. So they're basically shaping their offerings to speak to the advertising industry, to, to play in, oh, their, yeah, in, in their world. 
Finally. The entire the entire Google uh, preferred program is literally just a mea culpa, I think. <laughs> Sorry, we the, haven't been addressing your concerns or your yeah, platforms or, or the way you report and make money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, historically, you know, the biggest criticism on the brand side of, uh, against YouTube was you just don't understand how we do business and you want us to do how business the way you know. Uh, and YouTube has like just historically never sort of adapted. Uh, this past year, I think they finally started to adapt. And it kind of became a, a funny joke at the Brandcast when um, when uh, Robert Kinsel sort of said, "I hope you know we finally made you happy." And you know, a lot of the brands when they left said, "Okay, like that was better." It was actually one of the more highly um, highly reviewed uh, new front events of the of the week was YouTube's Brandcast. And I think it's because they were finally talking to advertisers in the way that advertisers wanted them to talk to them. Right. I think that that's fascinating. That's not way of saying that, I know. <laughs> well, you know, I think also I've participated in their education programs as part of my teaching at Loyola, and they have made this huge effort to have a lot of education classes at their spaces. They're training people. They're training educators. They want people to come in and really understand the platform so that everyone can start to leverage it on a whole new level. And I, I was impressed by that, by their education program. Um, and that you can get YouTube cert certified. And it's actually hard to get YouTube certified because I, I've been taking the class for like months just because I don't have the time. But, you know, there's hours of video you have to watch and then there's tests you take. And you c it's easy to fail the tests because they're hard mm -hmm. and they're very mm -hmm. serious about it. But the, the education piece is very well done, I thought. And I think that's really smart. It's like giving out razors and then everyone will buy the blades, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I was telling someone buying having a k-cup machine and then getting addicted to those little pouches mm -hmm. uh, which is which is definitely my problem right now but <laughs> so what what's turning you on like what trends from a technology perspective are you Sahil Patel um, seeing as we enter now our famous tell us what tech trends turn you on segment <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you can tell, but John and I have been working on <laughs> partnering on sound effects. So what? Could you, could you do that one more time, actually. It just, it was, it was <laughs> so what? What the question was? What tech trends are you seeing out there that's really um, firing up this business? What's turning you on on the technology side that you see is really being impactful to this very world that we've been talking you know, about? I think the the thing that uh, fascinates me the most, um, you know, a lot of people for a long time have believed that the future of, I think, uh, entertainment content is going to be app-based, right? You're going to have a, a, a grid of apps instead of a regular TV guide where you can watch an, uh, an app that's Netflix, but then also watch an app that's maybe YouTube or one of the networks within YouTube. And I think we're finally beginning to see a little bit of a move towards that beginning, which with, with just the ability for a bunch of uh, uh, I guess a better way to put it is, you know, now we have like several, several uh, companies launching and, and going and going uh, public in the sense of uh, just talking about themselves, being able to help uh, content creators of all sizes uh, launch mobile apps. And I think that's the beginning where it's not necessarily like if I was a filmmaker and I was putting stuff on Vimeo or YouTube, I would have to sort of rely on the fact that it was, I would have to rely on the Vimeo or YouTube mobile app to get my content out there. Now, uh, for you know varying costs depending on who you work with, you actually have the ability to launch an app that's entirely branded to what you want, what you to you right. to yourself to who you are. And I think that's definitely going to help sort of shape um, shape what we sort of well, what would eventually be, I think, the future of, of, of at least television, quote unquote, yeah, content, is which gonna, is app based. Is this going to be what it's going to look like? Like people make fun of my phone because I don't know if we could see it, but mm -hmm. I have like a gazillion apps and folders here because I'm always looking at stuff. So are you right. saying that every individual content creator is going to have like, we'll have the world of Schwartz app and that will have house all my content. Um, and that's how you'll watch my show. Or will it be more of, you know, lately I've been using time Warner's TV everywhere app, wherever mm -hmm. I am in the world. And I watch any channel network I want, as long as I'm somewhere where they can authenticate my username and password. Um, and in certain regions, they limit what shows you get access to. But what do you think is going to be the model there? You know, are we going to be working inside of a large aggregator? Or is it really going to be, I just know this app gives me the content I want? I think, I think what's likely to happen is for the people who, um, I think you always have the ability to directly follow or directly download an app of the particular creator or the particular studio or the particular network that you want to watch. 
But I do think uh, curation is going to be, become an increasingly important thing in terms of uh, surfacing the stuff that you don't know about, what you do want to watch, the apps that you don't know about, but you are likely to enjoy spending time on. So that's def definitely going to be a, a major element of it. I think um, this is still a long ways away. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to have tiers and it's going to work from there where you're going to have your SWAT platforms and your apps for your major networks and all of those. And then there's also going to be more um, targeted uh, personality-based apps or you know magazine apps, a lot of different things. Uh, so it'll be so, a combo, a combo, a layering of here's it, where I get everything, here's where I get the things that are targeted to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I, I, the best way I guess I can put it, and it, it's not just simply trying to hedge your bets either way. I think it's literally just eventually we're going to be allowed to curate what we want. Um, and I think that's going to play a massive role. So, you know, if I'm, re I'm really into sports and I think. Uh, are, are you really into sports? Is that true? Massively into sports. Yes, yes. I uh, did not I know that. We've never talked about that. What's not at all. Not at all. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I can imagine a day in the future where, you know, as, you know, as readily available as Watch ESPN is on my Roku right now, um, there will be a platform where I can have Watch ESPN, but next to it could be an app for, uh, you know, this digital uh, sports media company called Whistle Sports, which has, you know, some interesting, fun content to watch online, which is not uh, you know, league or game based, but it's um, uh, it's more creator centric or just you know online content. So I can totally imagine me being able to curate what I want to watch based on Sports. the brands and the creators that I know. And I think uh, I don't know exactly how that will eventually shape out, but I do believe uh, eventually the 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 end viewer, the end consumer, how you know however you want to describe us when we're not talking about the industry, uh, is going to play a bigger role in how the content is presented to them. And how do you, at this moment in time, saw so hip tail, how do you watch video right now? Are you a broadcast television viewer? You go into your living room, you turn on NBC. Are you more of a connected box? You watch on Xbox or your Samsung connected TV? Or are you all tablet, PC-based? Like, what, what's your groove? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, when I finally uh, graduated from college and became a cord cutter, uh, I had, uh, you know, uh, with my, along with me, along with my roommates, we have um, access to, you know, we pay for Hulu Plus, we pay for Netflix, uh, we have access to Crackle, we have a Roku on which we get all these, uh, but we also have parents who pay for ESPN and have, and pay for HBO, so we also get those channels, and we don't necessarily need a cable uh, cable subscription. That said, uh, uh, funny that you we have this interview today, uh, because uh, last weekend, we finally, uh, jumped, uh, finally made the call and uh, ordered uh, the most basic uh, broadcast package because, of course, the NFL season starting. And, you know, okay. the last bastion of traditional media, I think, is live sports, and it's going to be for some time. So, so, you, we, so you became a cord-er um, yeah. just because of that. And do you think you'll cancel after the sports season? No, I think, I think we'll keep it because at the end of the day, um, it's not just NFL, it's all sports, but you know, it's nice to have that, like, uh, that access uh, readily available in my, uh, in my home. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's not costing us much, right? It's, it's what, like $25? And, right. at, and, we, and we, we've talked about it, we've talked extensively about it. I've never felt, and uh, me along with my roommates, we've never felt any reason to need to pay for uh, actual like, exorbitant cable package. We kind of have that kind of access already. Uh, so yeah, I'm um, I'm watching a lot. I'm watching a lot on my television. I'm watching a lot on my Roku. But yeah, I also use my iPad. I also use my uh, my laptop, my Mac. Um, so it's really um, the that only thing I don't so really use is my smartphone. Oh, interesting. So you're not watching video on your phone? Not even little clips or little face Facebook movies or Instagram videos or Snapchat stories or anything like that? Uh, I'm one of the few people of my age who uh, doesn't have a Snapchat and won't ever. Uh, <laughs> because why? <laughs> because it's just like, come on, like just the, the idea behind it. Just come on. You, mean, you don't have time for that. <laughs> just, it's just like, God. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. I mean, that's how I feel about a lot of these things. I don't have time. I mean, as you get. I think it's it's demographic. It's definitely demographic, but it's also just time. You know, as you get older, you're working. You have more responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're t starting to take care of kids. You're starting to maybe take care of your parents. Is in my case where I'm sandwich gen. So any free time I have is going to be very select and targeted, mm -hmm. and it's going to be I'm going to watch, you know, Fringe or whatever my goofy niche TV show is. And the the truth is, it changes how I consume. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's on Time Warner. Sometimes it will be just a uh, log on to, 
you know, mm-hmm. website. I mean, it's it's really I'm driven by where can I get that show that I want to watch right now. And I've yes. I've actually roamed around my house to find shows. So if I can't find it on, you know, the Time Warner box, then I'll go to my Apple TV and then I'll go to the Roku and then I'll go to the Xbox cuz just because my husband and I are both technologists, you know, we have every box, but they're not in every yes. room. So mm-hmm. my my the way that I think is I will find this show. You're not going to stop me. I will do it legally first, but then if I can't do it legally, I'm going to find it, you know? Uh, I, same here. Uh, same, same thing with most of, most of my friends. If they're not going to find it legally, uh, they're going to find a way to Right, and uh, we want to. Right, don't you want to find it legally first? I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm speaking now. I think millennials actually don't mind paying for things, micropayment subscriptions, as long as... Yeah. Right, you, you don't mind that as long as it's easy. Yeah. And as long as you're getting what you paid for, the problem is that they make it so hard for you sometimes. Yeah. I think I think the main thing is, you know, uh, you're always going to have a, a percentage that's just going to download illegally no matter what. My, my favorite thing to say was, you know, when, uh, when Netflix first sort of launched into uh, original programming and, uh, you know, uh, they, they debuted the, the fourth season of Arrested Development. Uh, and I think there was a, some sort of report that said like it was pirated this amount of times. And my my thought about that entire thing was like, so th- there are people who would rather pirate a show than pay a f- than sign up for Netflix, use that three months to watch whatever the hell you want to watch, including the new season of Arrested Arrested Development, and then just not you know sign up to actually pay. You'd right. rather pirate it than actually do it in the in that you know legal way where you're allowed to. So I think there's always a group that's going to not want to pay for anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but I think more more people. Yes, I mean, I, I would pay for something if if it was easily available to me and I really wanted to watch. It. I have no problem doing that. A lot of my friends feel um, the same. Are the same way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also, you know, when it comes to at least device type, um, and of course, I've watched uh, videos on my smartphone from time to time. But you know, the content you're going to watch on there for most people, I think, is never going to be similar to what you're you know sort of watching on your tablet on your on your connected TV. Um, on, on the bigger screen. It's just, uh, you know, I've never been like, yeah, I'm going to sit down and, you know, grab my smartphone and watch uh, an episode of The West Wing. No, I'll, I'll go to Netflix. A bigger on my, screen, I'll, right. Yeah, it's the, it's the type of content. I'll watch maybe like sports highlights or just a quick video or a music video or a performance of something right. on my phone as, as I'm waiting for something maybe, but I'm, I'm not, that's not going to be my screen of choice to watch a big content. thing, that's, yeah. So um, it's, it's context. Incredibly convenient other type. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's another big thing. I think we, sometimes we talk about like digital video, but we kind of have to, and uh, we've talked, we kind of hinted at this throughout the conversation, but we kind of forget sometimes that not all content is equal. And, and people, um, you know, you can say a lot of content can be premium, but even then it's not all equal. I think that definitely matters when it comes to how and, and, and why people want to watch it. Oh my God, you're so right. I mean, I, just again, as a parent and as a parent that travels with her kid a lot, there are times when I will like find a piece of kid video and I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how fuzzy it is. I'll pay a lot for it. I just want my kid watching something so I can do whatever it is I have to do. And then there's other times when I'm like, no, no, that's not HD and I want it on the big screen and Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to pay for it. I mean, I, I, I conflict with myself, but it's really contextual. It's like, what do I need? It goes goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Like um, if I'm, if I'm a, 13, 13 year old uh, kid right now, and I want to watch my favorite YouTube blogger. Um, I don't necessarily need amazing television style quality as long as I'm enjoying this whatever this person is showing me. Um, but if I'm if I'm looking to watch a TV show and it's blurry and bad, then yes, that will affect how I view that piece of content. But it is all relative; it's all contextual. Uh, so even even if kids are not necessarily differentiating between screens anymore they definitely can they definitely understand what content is they definitely understand they what know what they favorite. like they know yeah what they exactly like, yeah. and they know what to expect for that piece of, for that type of content i know what to expect when i watch a certain type of show versus a certain type of video and i think that's always important and again we don't talk about that enough in this industry it's always just like is it of a high production quality or is it uh is it you know delivered in the in, in, a, in a similar fashion to what you could come to expect it's, no it sometimes it just comes down to does it meet my expectations for what I expect out of that content? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So it all goes back to that contextual thing. So um, now we're entering the the last uh, phase of our show today, and that is, um, you know, what um, what do you where do you find out everything? Now I know as a reporter and literally as Video Inc's editorial director, you have a process, but 
do you are there certain people that you call are there newsletters that you read you know what's your, your what's your like i have to read this every day like i wake up <laughs> what's happened that is uh, our cue oh, for <laughs> <laughs> we're still playing. We'll work on that one, yeah. John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded more like we were about to go out on the dance floor yeah. or something, <laughs> as opposed to you telling us where you get your trends. But um, what, what's your explore? Like, how do you explore your world? You, you get up in the morning. Are there certain things that you have to read? Yeah, or do, or do you so. sleep, actually, Sahil? Because I don't know if you actually sleep. <laughs> I don't sleep much. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone's waiting for your newsletter to come out so they know what's going on. So where, do, where like do you... Some nights, some nights I'm just like, you know, I, I would love to like sort of send a, a mass email to everyone I know and be like, everyone just like chill for 15 minutes. Don't do anything. <laughs> don't, no news, nothing. Just relax. <laughs> yeah, nothing don't... happened today. Go Grab back. a drink, you know, watch, just relax, yeah. you know, it's okay, we can wait 15 minutes. Um, I would say, it's, you know, for me, getting the news is twofold. Uh, obviously, just always talking to people in this space and, you know, what they're concerned about, what they're, uh, quote unquote, hearing, but also just uh, what they find to be interesting and relevant about, about the industry. Um, that's always incredibly informative in shaping what I need to cover, what I need to keep a so, so, you're, of. so your network, you're constantly talking exactly. to your, your brand folks, your advertising folks, your technology folks, you're keeping your ecosystem close to you. Right. So you, so you source what, what the hot stories are. Uh, right. And is there any, any trades that you read every day? Um, not again, as the, as the video Inc editorial director, but as just like you, t it turns you on and, and feed, feeds you. Right. Um, I would say, you know, if removing the fact that uh, I have to, Read Variety, Deadline, and The Hollywood Reporter, uh, sort of as they as they sometimes cover what I uh, what I'm covering. Um, the one I independently like, just by 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 the fact that I think I agree with a lot of their writers' opinions. Um, uh, I, I sort of have a feeler uh, similar approach to how I treat sort of digital media and traditional media. I think Recode's a great one. Yeah. Um, yep. I just think they have a the perspective is uh, a lot more measured and. and I, and honest, it's not too pessimistic. It's not too optimistic. It's and it's just, it's business metal. business centric, and that's Walt Mossberg and Kara Switcher's play yeah. after, after they left um, Wall Street Journal. So mm -hmm. Recode, which you can get as a newsletter, and what else? What else uh, spins your wheels? Uh, in general, I always enjoy um, reading sort of the more tech centric stuff from uh, uh, Jason Hirshhorn's Media Redefined. You know, uh, yeah. he always he always knows how to I mean, kind of back to curation, like he knows how to pick. Uh, really interesting sort of pieces that uh, feel relevant within the broader uh, digital media space. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that, big a fan of that newsletter. I still do read Synopsis, you know, you yeah. know, it's my, I was there for two years, so I, I, I like to keep track and it's a good way to sort of to see and what's you, going and on. And you launched day. their digital newsletter, right? I didn't launch it, but I, uh, we grew it when I got there. It was, you know, back before me, um, for, I think it had been out for like a year, or a little bit more than that. It was like trying to cover everything, but everything, and when I say everything, I mean everything. And the people, <laughs> who, people who are subscribing to Synopsis don't really care about like everything, right? Everything. They care about mobile, you know, not mobile, uh, they care about, you know, digital entertainment or en entertainment and then how digital sort of, um, affects that. Uh, so we, we definitely, narrowed the focus towards video when I when I sort of uh, started there and I you know, was less covering the latest Facebook update because come on <laughs> unless it's relevant to your studio or network it's like oh this update will sort of make it easier for me to distribute videos or get people talking about or promote my stuff like it doesn't really matter right um, so we made it when I got there we made it a little bit more video video digital video focused yeah, I mean, I'm just always, uh, like I said before, at the top of this, I always am so impressed with, um, you know, your slant on things and just how you're picking out the, you know, the hot, the insights around it. So is there anything coming up um, in the industry that we, you think uh, our listeners should be paying attention to? Anything going on in the next month that we shouldn't miss? Uh, I would say it's a tough time to ask that question only because for me, the next month is entirely devoted to... Um, uh, advertising week New York at right. the end at the end of the month right uh, so if there is one thing to pay attention to but I wouldn't have to tell your listeners to do that <laughs> it's a big thing every year uh, I'm and this is a week a week in New York where everyone descends and there's panels and conferences and just meetings and it's just all about you know advertising not only digital but regular yeah um, yeah absolutely so uh, you're running around covering yeah and I, I, I'm actually uh, particularly interested this year uh, only because it feels it's, 
I would say there's a general sense, at least and I, no one might, would have to agree with me, but I just feel it. Uh, I feel like digital this year has uh, is a little bit more accepted. It's, it, there's a little bit less condescension about the digital guys this year as opposed to other years. Um, so I'm, I'm it's sort of realer. fascinated. It's realer. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's less about like, oh, eventually it's going to change everything and more about like, okay, we clearly have to be paying attention because um, <laughs> it's affecting our business model across the board, whether you're a, you're a content provider, you're a brand, uh, anyone in the space. So I think I'm interested to see how that sort of plays out this year because it does feel less about, oh, look at the little kid in the, in the, in the park. It's more about like, okay, here's a new guy, but maybe we should be paying attention to the new guy. Are you, um, uh, is uh, Video Inc. Um, hosting or moderating any panels or any events um, in the next month? Uh, we are, we are, we're, well, we have a private event at the end of the month during Advertising Week. <laughs> right. That's just more on video tech, which should be fun. Um, but not because of that, uh, we're taking sort of the normal pa uh, panel circuit uh, event stuff, uh, taking a month off of that. Because we normally do a, a, a monthly event, uh, always in New York, sometimes uh, both in New York and L.A., uh, and it's usually just a panel series focusing on a different topic each time. Uh, but skipping that this month for this other event that we're doing. Well, um, you know that I'll follow you wherever you go, except for New York right now because I'm too busy to go there. But uh, <laughs> well, are you coming for Advertising Week or not? Um, you know what? I may. I may. I'm not. I'm not sure yet. I have a lot of travel in October, November, and December, so I just have to figure it all out. Um, are you going to uh, the other one? I guess is MIPCOM, right? Uh, um, there's also the um, uh, IAB. Just sort of uh, made it known the IAB Digital uh, Upfronts happening in the UK uh, in mid October. That's another one. That I guess. Uh, oh, before. that one I didn't know about. Um, I have a couple of. I have an international event, and then um, I'm actually working on the Consumer Electronics Show right now, um, prepping for that. Even though that's five months away, that the, my work for that starts right away, and then I have a couple of keynotes and other things coming up. Um, but well, yeah, January is both nappy yes, and CES. Yes, that's a crazy, topic. January's nuts. Yeah, um, and then in between, in between is Sundance, which is always fun. Yeah, so uh, it's, I mean, you're, you're everywhere too. And lastly, is there anything you're publishing, anything you're working on that we could um, look out for outside of um, Video Inc.? Any, anything you're writing independently? Have you thought about writing a book? Am I, am I surprising you by asking you that? Or do you have a book in the works? <laughs> Uh, I, I guess the best way to put it is I'll write a book the day I don't have to write anything else. <laughs> the last thing I think about when I have free time is, oh, I want to write more. Uh, <laughs> good, yes, good point. Um, <laughs> the, day, the day where I'm not uh, as uh, turning out as much as uh, I'm turning out right now, I can actually breathe a little bit. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll write, I'll write something maybe. I don't know. We'll, well, well, I mean, this has been so informative to me. I always learn so much talking to you, and you, you just have this and understanding that very few people have of the space. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Ladies and gentlemen in the room here, let's have a big hand, hand applause for Sahil Patel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> No, calm down. No, no. He's he's in New York. Stay with. Sit down. Get off your chair. Sit. Okay. God, they're crazy here. Thank you so much, my friend, and <laughs> thank you all for joining us here at the Tech Cat Show, going over trends that impact your business. Um, we'll be back in a week, and we can't wait to uh, to talk to you again. And ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't subscribed to Video Inc. yet. Please, videoinc.com, really the most impactful newsletter I read every day. And look out for Mr. Saw Hill Patel, the man in the know. Sassy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Keep that air conditioning on. It is hot in this town. Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. You make me Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's 